trachea, EMG, from the stenocardiomastoid muscle without sound. The best way, and I'm describing the best way here, although like I said, there are other ways of doing this, the best way to control for muscle contraction is to record the EMG. But when I say EMG, I am not talking about needle electrodes. I am talking about the same surface electrodes that you are using to record the CVEP. What I do here on my system, because every system, every person or every laboratory has their own system, you try to adapt using the systems that you have. This is actually a sensory nerve conduction study recording. The reason I am using a sensory nerve conduction study recording is that it allows me to do a rectified recording. And what do I mean by rectified recording? Rectification, what does this fancy word mean? All this means is that you are taking the EMG, which is composed, as you know, of negative and positive phases, and you are taking it all to one side. So in this case, you are making the EMG all negative phase. You need to average the EMG as well. If you were to EM, average the EMG as it is, without rectification, the result would be zero. And this would not allow you to do a division. So what you, what you need to do, if you are able to record EMG and you have this on your software, is to rectify your EMG signal, average the EMG signal at the end, and you will get a definite value. And with this, you divide your rectified EMG or corrected EMG average, and you divide it into the CVEMP amplitude. And how does this normalize the results? The stronger the contraction, or the larger the EMG, the larger the CVEMP amplitude. But by taking the ratio, for that same person, the ratio will remain constant. The reason this is an advantage, and this is the best way to uh, control for EMG contraction, there are two reasons. One, there are several dedicated systems devoted to VEMP recording that require you to reach a minimum level of EMG contraction. For example, 50 microvolts. Not everyone will be able to reach that level. Many elderly patients that I record from can, will reach 20, 25 microvolts, usually not more than that. So using a dedicated system that only allows you to record after reaching a minimum value will not allow you to, do, to, to record from these same patients. And the other reason, again, with regards to elderly people, is that uh, what I, the, if I take a step back, there are many publications in the literature that mention the fact that it is not possible to record from, el from the elderly. Take my word for it, in all elderly patients that I have examined up to now, where you ex expect, uh, um, expect a VEP, I get them on every occasion. The trick with regards to the elderly and with some other patients as well, is that you, you do not need too much contraction. A minimum level of contraction is enough to get a VEMP response. So in an elderly person, if you try to get them to contract to, for example, 50 microvolts, because that's what the system asks you to do, you will fail in most cases because most pe people, especially elderly people, cannot reach that level. But if you can get a minimum amount of contraction, you will still get a CVAMP because you were able to record a ratio for that patient. And, how to, and when, when I say minimum amount of contraction, in all patients, as I, I do my uh, studies ask when, the, when the patient is in a lying down position. I ask the patient, lift your head up from the pillow so that you just about do not lift, feel the pillow below your head. That is enough to get a very good CVEMP response. And I'll show you some examples of that, uh, not only in this um, lecture, but in the following lecture, where I'll be talking about clinical applications. And here I show why it's important to monitor EMG. So this is an example of a patient 
um, uh, CVAMP recording from the left ear and the right ear. If you look at the CVAMP on its own, you will see that the, the CVAMP on the left is larger than the CVAMP on the right. There is no abnormality here. There is no asymmetry. This CVAMP study is normal. The reason it's normal, it is normal and the reason the CVAMP is larger in, from the left ear is that the EMG contraction was stronger on the left. When you take the, EM, the ratio of the CVAMP to the rectified averaged EMG, the ratio is equivalent to almost the same. So there is no asymmetry here, and this CVAMP study is normal. But unfortunately, I do see some studies in the literature where CVAMP uh, waveforms are published without any monitoring of EMG. And in my opinion, even, if, uh, even without EMG monitoring, some form of level of control of EMG contraction is necessary because of this phenomenon. And without EMG contraction, such studies are essentially unreliable. Now, if you have a brainstem auditory remote potential on your, in your laboratory, these are the parameters that you need to change the parameters on the brainstem auditory remote potential software so that you so they are able to record CVAMPs. Like I said earlier, you do not have to take this down. Send me an email, which I will show you at the end, and I can send you these parameters, no problem. And we published uh, together with an international group, uh, including um, Toshimura Fush from Japan, Faith Akin from America, and James Colbach from Australia. And we published this, um, I believe it was, yes, it was 2014, a few years ago, where we detail um, the how to correctly and homogeneously globally perform um, CVAMPs on a global scale. And in the time uh, left, I will talk about, uh, uh, if I have time left, ocular vestibular vault margin of potentials. Uh, Solara, do you have the time left for this uh, presentation? Yes, we still have almost 13 minutes. 13 minutes, very good, very good. Okay, so I'll be talking about the second um, type of vestibular vault myogenic potential that we have at our, at our disposal, ocular vestibular vault myogenic potentials. These were discovered later on, um, if I remember correctly, around 2010, 2012, um, at the behest of Sally Rosengren, at least uh, as well, uh, who's also in Australia. So the ocular vestibular vault myogenic potential, in this case, instead of recording from the stenocleidomastoid muscle on the same side, we record from the inferior oblique muscle on the opposite side, on the other side to the ear being stimulated because the ocular vestibular vault myogenic potential pathway that we are recording from from this examination is a crossed pathway that crosses over to the other side. In contrast to the CVEP, we record instead of from the sacral, mainly from the utricle this time, and this time instead of from the inferior vestibular nerve, the superior vestibular nerve. We also have other structures being recorded from in the brainstem, but instead of going down towards the spinal cord, we, this time we move up towards the midbrain, the ocular motor nucleus, and towards the inferior oblique muscle. And in contrast, the CVAMP again, instead of an inhibitory response, we are recording an excitatory one. So the setup again is simple. This is from a study by Sally Rosengren in the um, studies that kicked off um, uh, our knowledge with regards to the, uh, the OVEMPs, where the recording electrodes are placed, both electrodes placed below the eye that we are interested to record from. Both electrodes. So the, the active recording electrode is placed, you find the orbital ridge below the eyeball and you place it on the ridge, of the, uh, on, uh, right on the ridge. The, recording, the, the reference electrode is placed below that. There are some publications that talk about one centimeter, two centimeters, 2.5 centimeters. You do not need to take a measuring tape to do this. 
the important thing here is that the reference and the active electrodes are not touching. So this is what's important here. Again, I emphasize here that this is the, the setup used by those in the vestibular field recording from uh, using or uh, recording over recording OVAMPs with both electrodes below the contralateral eye. It's important that you follow this setup so that your reference electrode is not contaminated by other waveforms. Other places on the head, if you place the reference electrode, for example, on the chin or on the, on the forehead, you will likely pick up responses from the other side, the ipsilateral side, because there are waveforms being produced from the uh, uh, ipsilateral side as well, and you, you will not get a clear response that you know will be solely attributed to the ear that you are stimulating or you're interested in stimulating. You do not want a contamination from the other side. So stimulating the left, for example, one ear, recording below the other eye with both electrodes below that eye, active and reference below that. So the contraction this time, because you need contraction of the inferior oblique muscle, the contraction here is easier than for the stenocleidomastoid muscle. In this case, you ask the patient to look all the way up as much as they can. The reason we do that is that the inferior oblique muscle is brought outwards towards the surface and below the active electrode. So with the contraction or the looking up of the eye upwards, there is a movement of the inferior oblique muscle outwards closer to the active electrode. To help you do this, for us, where we have the patient in a lying down position, we have a mark on the wall behind the patient's head where we ask the patient to look. We place the position of the mark such that the patient just about sees the mark. We need maximum contraction to get a large response. For those who have a sitting, for the patient sitting in the chair, you have the mark up on the ceiling. We also avoid sidewards eye deviation. Um, there are some patients, despite their best efforts, where their gaze will de deviate sometimes towards the left or to the right. This is not trivial, this is very important. You need to ask the patient to look up toward, down the midline and look at the mark that you have and maintain it there because any movements away from the midline and the inferior oblique muscle will move away from the recording electrode and you will lose your response. So this is an example of uh, an ocular vestibular evolved myogenic potential in our laboratory. It is an excitatory response, so you will see a mainly negative response followed by a positivity. You will occasion, or actually very frequently, obtain other waves following this. These are also, these also originate from the inferior oblique muscle, but the standard is to record amplitude or latency from the first peak. Can we record from other peaks, especially when the second peak sometimes is larger? In theory, you can. No one has done a study on this. So as far as we know, we always record from the, the first peak. Is it possible to record from the other peaks as well? Possibly, but no one has done a study on this yet. On this yet. Uh, there is no need to record EMG. Um, because the reason being is that the, 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 reasoning, the reason given is that this is an excited response. Could you record EMG to make sure that you are getting the best EMG response? You could, but again, no one has done a study on this. So from what we know up to now with regards to the literature and how to perform OVAMPs, you simply record the waveform as it is, recording the amplitude as it is with no normalization, um, no EMG, parallel EMG, just record the response as it is and ask the patient to look up as much as they can. The stimulus is the, the same, um, a 90 decibels tone or 100 decibels click, and um, you average around 100 stimulations. So this um, waveform summarizes the methodology with regards to the vestibular vault myogenic potentials. Sound stimulation is used to stimulate the vestibular system because of the close proximity of the, um, the, otolith, um, the, the otolith end organs 
to the, the oval window, either tones or clicks. Tones, 90 decibels is enough. If you only have clicks, you need to use at least 100 or a bit better 110 decibels above average hearing threshold. Recording is performed from the tonically active muscle. The ipsilateral stenocleidal mastoid muscle, perceivems, will record mainly sacular function and its pathway through the brainstem. And the contralateral inferior oblique muscle, or ovems, recording mainly utricular function. And as promised, and I will give this email at the end of my second lecture as well, which will be uh, very soon, where I'll, where, where I'll be talking about clinical applications of VEMPS. So this is my email. Like I said, you can send me your waveforms if you like. I can give you further tips as to how to better obtain your responses. And if you would like a PDF uh, copy of this presentation, together with, with the parameters, I don't mind. I can send them to you, no problem. So this is the end of my presentation. And if allowed, I can accept questions at this point. We have four minutes. I think we can take two questions or depending on the questions. Okay. No question to know. Um, I think most probably you're gonna cover this in your, oh, I have a question regarding montage of for VEMP, if possible, or VEMP. I don't know if I will be able to see the question or will I hear the question? I'm, uh, I, uh, it's about the montage of OVAM. Yes. What, what's the question? The montage. How do you place the electrodes? Ah, okay. So, for example, if you are stimulating the, um, the left ear, you are recording below the right eye. You locate the orbital ridge where the eyeball sits. You find the ridge here and you place the active electrode on the mid in the middle. Again, this is all surface recording. So in the middle, below the pupil as the, as the person is looking forward, the reference electrode is below that. Like I said before, there are some publications that talk about one centimeter below, two centimeters below, 2.5. As long as the two electrodes are not touching, it doesn't matter where you put it, as long as it's close, but not touching, so there's no shorting. The ground, again, can be either on the forehead. I usually put it on the forehead, the ground electrode. Some uh, papers place it on the sternum, uh, 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 close, but not too far down, close here. That is okay, but my habit is to place the ground electrode on the forehead. Um. I don't know if you can hear me, but we have a question regarding children and normal value for age. Yes. Personally, I know that CVAMP can be done as early as six months, but OVAMP, I cannot personally do them before two years and a half, three years. It's hard for them to understand what I'm trying to say and keep their eyes focused. What, what is your experience? Unfortunately, I don't have much experience with children due to the nature of our, our, of our institute. Uh, we see mostly adults. Um, I could see children, although I haven't tapped into that patient population left. Clearly, um, vestibular myogenic potentials is important to do in children, not only with regards to imbalance that you might see, but there are many publications in the literature that talk about delay in psychomotor development when there is vestibular dysfunction. So it's very important to do uh, VEMPs in children as well. I would like to, and I'm sure very soon I will do, although my cases are predominantly adult. Um, but the principle, like you mentioned now, is the same. Uh, the question there is, is how patient you are and how cooperative the children are, how you are able to grab their attention. Okay. Uh, we're less than a minute before ending, so we'll see you again in 20 minutes for part two. Okay, thank you very Thanks much. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.